afternoon. My name is Nitya and uh, I'll present today my paper titled Good is Gold, Ornaments in Circulation and the Making of Moral Personhood in South India. And my objective in this paper is to, um, using um, 10 years of research in small villages and a town in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, reflect on some of the questions that people have been asking uh, since the morning about demand for gold, about the circulation of gold, about the value of gold, and about its relationship to finance in the Indian economy. So um, at, at the 50th, um, anniversary, uh, anniversary of independence, the chairman of the Reserve Bank said gold and silver run like twin threads in India's economic destiny. And that was in 1997. And he said that the policymakers have been preoccupied with uh, questions of gold. And that, of course, has only increased uh, since then. And the ki kinds of questions were uh, the ones discussed this morning about concerns about the imports of gold. What does that mean about for, for foreign exchange? Um, People have qu incorrectly quoted Keynes saying it's the ruinous love for a barbaric relic, um, which is t where he's talking about the gold standard, but it's still telling that people thought this was an appropriate way to describe India's con continued interest in o owning gold. But then there were distinguished policymakers like YB Reddy, uh, Kanandal, Chandravakar, IG Patel, who said that just because it was traditional doesn't mean it's backward, doesn't mean it's irrational and doesn't mean it's undesirable. Actually, there's a very clear logic um, to why people why pe people in India own gold. Uh, people always say gold is important um, in, to Indian culture, society, historically. Uh, they talk about gendered assets, inheriting, gifting, sacredness. But in my paper, what I'm trying to do is say, if gold is important to Indian culture, what does that really mean? How do we understand, uh, how do we unpack this uh, relationship between gold and culture and um, to think about culture as not being a, a set of rules something set, fixed in place but rather that something that's being created every day and to think of society as people who are constantly engaged in this co-production of culture and the, and value is what people uh, consider moral what can people consider to be powerful and respect worthy and that's constantly being shaped um, by these processes of meaning making that people are sharing and there exists a grammar that people share um, ways of displaying if you say gold is a symbol of status what are the kinds of acts that people sh they, or what, what are the kinds of ways in which people display it and what are the ways that people look and see and perceive it to be a, perceive it to be signifying of status there is a grammar of exchange kind of codes that people understand and they're all, and they also become these kind of patterns which are not necessarily visible. You don't necessarily um, realize, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to wear this and symbolize this kind of status. But we have these rules that kind of become I implicit and uh, dispersed, um, these kind of templates for how we live and understand each other. And we have institutions that form through these patterns uh, of thought and action which establish, establish themselves like even like religion. And... Um, and then to understand all this is knowledge being historically produced through layers of sedimentation. So culture is both something that's being determined every day, but also something that has very long roots. And the, so the kind of puzzle is to understand um, how these two work. And I think the, um, the thing is that gold is something that's very interesting because of the fact that it has had um, value uh, across so many different time periods, so many different parts of the world. And so this understanding of how does the valuing of gold every day uh, in India relate to that is kind of a fascinating uh, question. Thinking about this, the significance of gold as ornaments in India, just some categories is one is that it's cosmological, it symbolizes auspiciousness, prosperity, and purity. Uh, it's cosmopolitan in the sense that it translates a, uh, in value across um, national boundaries. Um, so it can be converted into fiat, fiat, into fiat currency and um, but also this kind of sense of auspiciousness um, and these kinds of values are also cosmopolitan in the sense that uh, they also translate across national boundaries. Uh, I think an important part of the value of gold is that it's speculative. Uh, 
um, that because there's this uncertainty that's determined in the kind of uh, work like Professor Niharika shows, you know, like it's every day, uh, every second it's being traded and um, and because the price is changing, that has, it gives it a certain value. And I think it's this kind of speculation that we also have to understand, you know, if people are saying, uh, people are hesitant to bring their gold um, out, out from their cupboards, it's uh, you know if it's a senior citizen bringing their gold to um, to be to to the bank, are they thinking only if I'm my gold is worth six lakhs today and I'm only going to get five lakhs fifty thousand, or are they thinking I'm going to get fi uh, five lakh fifty thousand, but maybe tomorrow it'll be worth seven lakhs or eight lakhs? And in fact, if you have been following gold prices over the last a few years, this is what has happened. If you had so if you had sold your gold in 2019, you would have got much less for it, and so then you will also have this kind of regret that. Um, so just to think about what is that speculative function, oh, there's this kind of calculation that's happening, hierarchical in terms of it being representative status, um, sentimental in that it's embodied with relationships of those exchanging it, it's sacred in that it's marked with religious iconography, uh, it's indexical in that it's a marker of caste, it's aesthetic in that it's being perceived as being beautiful and defining body and person. Um, the, the work that I'm uh, presenting here is from Tamil Nadu. It's from uh, Adi Dravidar colonies, which are still segregated from the main Uru in the village where the upper caste and middle caste households live. And um, there are some changes in the discriminatory practices. For instance, to people who were 25 years old saying when we were children, we couldn't walk with our chapels in the village. Uh, women couldn't wear their saris all the way down. They'd say, what are you doing sweeping the streets? Um, and so, but now Dalit women can wear their, uh, you know, can wear saris, can um, wear footwear, can also wear gold. And um, there are people who are migrating for sugarcane cutting, for brick making, uh, to uh, urban centers. They work engaged in local agriculture and masonry. And, um, and this is something that has also given them access to gold. They say before we migrated, we didn't have, we didn't see gold. But now that they're getting um, advances, they're, buy, they're buying gold. And uh, so this is also something that has changed. And um, this, this research is part of a group that we did uh, during the pandemic, looking at household finances. And it was a time when a lot of people who migrate had returned back to the villages. And so the, um, I just two, two cases. One is that of uh, Suresh and Pooja, who are a young Adi Dravidar couple. They were cousins and they, um, when Suresh, um, Suresh, when they got married, Suresh's uh, in-laws, who were also his aunt and uncle, had given him a gold chain, but they subsequently took it back to uh, buy a Tata Ace to take to do for their business. And so this gold was immediately um, pawned and so circulating in this way. He had other ornaments which he had lent to his relatives who he stayed with when he worked in the city. During the pandemic, he pawned Pooja's chain to pay for the EMIs on a personal loan that he had taken. And so he was managing his finances in this way. And then in October of 2020, when gold prices were high, when there was still widespread unemployment because of the pandemic, he, when we were speaking to him, he said that he has to buy uh, gold for his cousin, uh, his father's sister's um, son. And uh, he said that we have to do this because um, they will say, what's the point in having a brother if you're not able to make this gift? And so then later I asked him, you know, how did you manage to do it? And he said, I'd been saving in a gold uh, scheme at GRT Jewelers and it matured at that moment. So luckily I had that. I just used that, bought the gold, but also to pay for all the expenses that he had to incur for, for this ceremony, he was able to um, report, uh, take, borrow some money, release his gold from the bank, and then re-pledge it because the gold prices had gone up so much. So he, using the gold and the gold savings that he had, he was able to, um, he was able to uh, manage. And also, um, subsequently, as the pandemic continued, uh, he. He, the original relatives who he had lent a lot of gold to, he would ask them for money a little bit at a time. And so we, so we see that gold that's gifted as into your son-in-law doesn't mean that you still lose claim. You can make claims on that gold. Um, when you lend gold to somebody, um, 
and this was very prevalent. If, if we looked at our study sample, everyone had lent coal to everyone. You had uh, people would have their little handi with all their uh, gold cheaties, and people would say, these are mine and these are from somebody else. So the amount of exchange of ornaments for each other to pawn was this huge and fascinating um, fascinating occurrence. And then we had another couple called Premila and Mahadevan. And Mahadevan was chronically ill. And then when we were speaking to them on the phone, they would always say, you know, we have no money to eat. Um, then between the two waves of the pandemic, when I had gone um, there, when I went to visit them, they we asked them, how are, how are you? What's happening? He said, the first thing they said is, my relative's puberty ceremony is tomorrow. They have given me this long list of all the things that I have to buy. We have no money. Um, and we have to buy all these things by tomorrow for this ceremony. So um, so in, in a sense, it seems unfair. I'm wondering how, how are they with absolutely nothing in hand, no income, uh, going to do this? And they say, no, but this is, the, this is not wrong that they're asking us to do it. We don't have, they don't have brothers and we don't have sisters, so we will do this for them and they will do it for us. And um, he, they said, D don't worry, uh, you know, you should come to the ceremony because it's going to be beautiful. The only problem is it costs money, but other than that, it's good. And um, so he had gone and he had taken a loan for 15% interest for the month, but then they were going the next day to the microfinance company to get uh, a loan. And they planned to release one pair of pledged earrings that they had to gift to this girl because gold prices were so high, they said, we can't buy it. But because they had this gold that they had borrowed a small amount against, they, they could gift that. And um, so then the next day we went to the, we went to the ceremony and just to give you kind of a flavor of, I don't know how clearly you can see, maybe we need the lights off if it's possible. Or, uh, just to give a uh, sense. Okay. So you have, the, everybody's getting ready. The people are coming across with their uh, gifts. So they, they prepared everything in uh, in the temple and then uh, came. It's not for. Okay. So. I think I just start. Oh, I think you can't see it all without the. Mm -hmm. It's, it's visible? Okay. So, I'll just start to see. Yeah, I think you can play this. Hmm? You just play? You can play this. Play it, okay. Who, who's playing? Who's playing? I'm playing, I'm playing. So, everyone is gathering or uh, coming, uh, coming to the house with all the different uh, gifts that they brought together. There's uh, a ceremony where you can see, I don't know how clearly, but one person is ex explaining to the brother how to, to, how to conduct this, he kind of plays with it a bit also and uses it to smack her in the middle. So it's kind of uh, doing their own thing. But then we also have the elders uh, of, uh, of the village. Four people have sat, uh, been brought to sit, and they call out what so-and-so, husband of so-and-so, wife of so-and-so is giving this. Um, and so what is also happening at this event is that there's this accounting of savings and gifts. So people who have been um, who have gifted, the, they, this family has gifted things to in the past, bring back those gifts. And so this investment in the ceremony is a way to bring back these other investments that you have made as gifts. Um, and there's this kind of accounting process that happens. So, so now to think, uh, to think a bit about what is happening uh, in these cases. So if you're thinking about loans of gold, uh, trying to understand if, if people have these, uh, a box of pawn tickets in their house and they show you these 50% of the pawn tickets are mine and 50% of the pawn tickets are somebody else's who they've lent me. And uh, you're thinking, um, you know, why are people lending each other ornaments in this way? And if you ask people, they always say that it's nambike, it's trust. Um, 
but then the conflict over not returned ornaments is also very common so we're speaking to somebody saying my neighbor standing outside my house he's saying his daughter's getting married he had given me his gold chain last month and i can't release it now um and so there's also this kind of breakdown of trust that's constantly happening but i think that thinking about how people explain why they lent the ornament to someone else how they um explain uh justify the delay in returning it is said sits at the heart of all these questions of what is individual interest what is collective interest here what is obligation what is negotiation what is resist, uh, resistance what are social ties and ruptures and then if you thinking about ceremonial gifts as a system of saving um they have the people are um the, the where you have this accounting system where gold is owed to others because it had been gifted to you in the past um you seeing that gold is both reciprocal saving and its debt and um it it comes to it connects some of this fundamental work in anthropology where uh, you have marcel moss who said that um that gold is always debt and at the same time there's also kind of spirit of the gift that that sorry gifts are always debt and at the same time there's also the spirit of the gift the creation of ties and so what's happening here is not just that people are you know i've i've given gifted one sovereign and getting one sovereign back uh it is a hedge in terms of prices uh, gold prices increasing so this is a careful calculation but also some of my, there's something being created in terms of social ties and sociability and uh so then and thinking about a marriage exchange you say to, to think about the gender of the gift is to ask about the situation of the gift exchange in relation to the form that domination takes in a society and so when we're looking at gifts from the natal to the marital home of the bride uh, dowry uh, if you're thinking about seer which is the constant gifts that the natal family of the bride has to give when the first child is born at all these different other uh other moments which i that can be used to understand what does gender mean in this context what does it mean to be a man or a woman um it's a question of brother sister relationships along the same uh way and if we are born together we have to do it so what does this mean uh, in terms of what is being constructed in terms of um sociability what is happening in terms of capital flows um it's a question of the meaning of marriage i think that um seeing marriage as a precarious bond and there's many possibilities for loss uh so it becomes this kind of talisman to avoid away dangers um and there's a kind there's a language for how it's uh, how it's carried how it's carried and carried out in terms of the fact that women will never show their tali but you can never take it off either so the tali itself is hidden and um but then but there are these kind of uh, feelings uh, these kind of stories associated with it like in this karnataka women saying that i'll never remove any of the gold i ever put on my tali chain because this is um that would be at putting my husband at risk um whereas at the same at the same time um there was somebody else who said I was doing so well I used to have gold from here to here speaking of the lobe of a hearing to the top but now I don't don't even have this and she showed a tali without it so even the tali is something uh, that does get pawned and replaced uh somebody saying that when uh, my tali fell off my husband took another wife a muslim woman so uh, so there are these kinds of co- coding that is um that's work that becomes embedded in these ornaments So the kinds of questions are how is the circulation of gold ornaments shaped by what is valued and what is considered moral in terms of these obligations to gift to display to look a certain way and what value or valued quantity equalities are being transferred through the exchange of ornaments when they are purchased lent to one another given to marital kin gifted to the host of life, life cycle events or mortgage for cash What is the symbolic significance of the acts that constitute the circulation of gold and their various interactions with each other how do these come together to make cultural meaning in india and how does one's identity become defined by the objects they give and receive by the acts of giving and receiving and by the recognition they receive uh, as a result of these acts um and so so in this way ornaments are measures of value uh, in that 
not just the money uh, the indian rupee value that you can get get by exchanging them but their presence or absence is significant they allow ranking uh, of people they allow um, comparison of quality they're also media of circulation they it's last they it's uh, they have physical form and they move between physical forms and they have in india become objects of desire in their own right um, and so i think this is something fascinating to understand about it's not just about the money value and so if when you're thinking about dis disincentivizing gold ownership then you have to think uh, you have to understand this kind of um, the kind of uh, the way this complex way in which it's valued and so if the power of money is the effect of a giant system of coordination of of human activity in which objects become pivots between the imagination and reality um then how how do we understand this role of gold what is it, this question of uh what they um what what they are what they are in physical form and what they represent is the capacity to buy the power to act the ability to be good the ability to be charitable uh, the ability to do right by your brother or your sister um and they these are all interrelated to e to each other because if you have gold that you can pawn you can support someone uh, but it's also not as simple as that uh, that simply having gold can make you feel wealthy and that it also translates into something different and so i think the question is how do we not just do you know semi structured interviews or surveys but how do we listen more carefully to understand in narratives how are people constructing this uh, this kind of discourse about how we value gold how do we understand this in culture uh, that where is it comparison where you're saying this is as valuable as gold or more valuable than gold um, so what is it saying about our value itself in india and value more broadly because i think because since gold has been um, and gold is kind of, uh, is a um, since gold has been valued in so many different uh, places it's like you can uh, you can understand that um it has this long history but to so, so think about decision making about capital and finances is only one aspect of many interconnected calculations in the making of a valued person and i think um as mr somo sundaram sir said this morning you know that there's something about gold that um as an asset class it um it has it's I I think the people who I'm talking about here do think about exactly how much gold they have every morning and they know exactly how much they have it's not uh, it's not lost but it has it's because it is uh, connect in valued in so many different scales um that is what is making it enduring uh, in that way and so if we're trying to think about how do you make other asset classes um as long term as gold then this i think this is something that you have to understand how uh, that gold is so many different things and has so many different relationships to being a valued person a powerful person a respected person and i'm not sure if other asset classes can mimic that in any way you know i think this is the fascinating uh, thing about gold and that's why it's lasting uh, so long and being so difficult to monetize and all these different things because there's this kind of fascinating nexus of things that's happening